It's not unlike Shield Hero to go and rearrange the events of the anime, but the way they're doing it in Season 2 is certainly a different one. Not only was a five-chapter training arc completely skipped, but the very essence of Rishia's backstory was disregarded as well. It's as if they just wanted to get straight to the next arc as fast as possible, leaving the rest of us confused as to how we got here and why things are happening the way they are right now. So, with the new season of Shield Hero underway, allow me to fill in those gaps with our new weekly cut content series. A spoiler-free look into everything the anime's missed from the novels so far. But first, this video is sponsored by Lord of Heroes, an animation RPG with stylized anime-esque graphics that puts you as this monarch on a mission to conquer the world. With a unique story that has you recruiting heroes to further progress, you'll come across all these interesting characters who you can then use in-game, each of which are fully upgradable to the max level via the in-game gear mechanics. Combine this with a whole plethora of beautifully animated 3D attacks and effects, and what you get is a core gameplay loop that's actually extremely appealing to look at. Then, with the new War of the Tyrant story update, you can further delve into the immersive lore of Lord of Heroes by going back to the past and witnessing the darker history of this chaotic world. An update that also includes the newest character, Dark Lucilica. Plus, with multi-language support for Korean, Japanese, and English, along with all the other languages coming in a couple of weeks, the game is pretty much accessible for everyone. So, if you're interested in a well-animated RPG with a captivating story, then feel free to use the link in the description to download it for free today. But now, let's get back to the video. Episode 26, A New Roar Covering very brief moments from the first 13 chapters of Volume 6, then continuing onward with Chapter 14 and 15. Obviously, I can't go in-depth with what's essentially three-quarters of the entire novel, but what I can do is focus on the key moments from the chapters that were skipped, the main events which likely won't be revisited in later episodes. So, starting things off with the meeting of the heroes, the actual purpose of this was to discuss how weak they all were. You see, the fact that Lark was able to remove all three heroes with just a single attack was nothing short of concerning for their future encounters. Normally, Naofumi wouldn't have cared too much about it, but his fight with Lark had made him realize that he needed them. Lark's ability to use what's called a defense rating attack meant that he could turn Naofumi's naturally high defenses against him. It was a potentially fatal weakness Naofumi knew Lark would be sure to take advantage of. So, with Lark's attacks that turn Naofumi's defenses into damage, as well as Glass's attacks that bypass his defenses completely, it was clear that a previously even fight had now shifted tides into the enemy's favor. Thus, the reason why the four heroes were having this meeting now. They were discussing the ways in which they could become more powerful. Of course, Naofumi had tried to lead this conversation with his recent discovery from the first season, but the idea that each of their unique leveling methods was fully valid and functional simply wasn't something the other heroes were willing to believe right now. Instead, it was just much easier to call Naofumi a cheater and a liar. There was nothing he could say or do that would make them even acknowledge him. The only point Naofumi was able to get across himself was that he actually wasn't as powerful as they believed him to be. You see, ever since Naofumi had demonstrated all those crazy abilities with the Shield of Wrath, the other heroes had come under the misconception that Naofumi could deal significant amounts of damage. What they failed to understand, though, was that the very act of attacking wasn't even possible for him. Yes, there were specific situations where his counters could cause passive damage, but to do anything more than that simply wasn't possible. It was a point that was made clear when Naofumi had stood up and punched Motoyasu right in the face. Though Naofumi's fist had very clearly made an impact, the damage done was completely nullified. Not a bit of pain could be felt by Motoyasu during the puncher even after. So, with that little display getting the heroes to shut up for a bit, Naofumi did try to get his points across once again, but the ensuing back and forth only led to more arguments. An entertaining quarrel that highlighted just how stubborn the other heroes really could be. Then, just as the conversation was about to boil over into a fight, that's when the Queen stepped in to intervene and change the topic. If the other heroes really weren't yet open to trusting Naofumi, then perhaps they could discuss their new opponents instead. So, with the most memorable thing about them being their legendary-like weapons and abilities, the Queen decided it was best to share a legend that might be related to it. A legend that spoke of the existence of seven additional weapons. Just like how there existed Naofumi and the other three heroes, there was also the potential for there to be seven more of them. A group globally known as the Seven Star Heroes, each of which possessed their own legendary weapon. The key difference between them and the main four, though, is that unlike how the main four have to be summoned in order to exist, the Seven Stars can be pretty much anyone. Whether it's a person isekai from a different world, or even a normal adventurer who was born in this one, 
any and all can have the opportunity to become a wielder of these seven legendary weapons. Now, normally a summoning process would be done to try and find the perfect hero, but in the event that that process does in fact fail, anyone with the ability to wield the weapon can try and do so. It's after they're then chosen to become the hero that the person who does typically becomes physically more powerful. It's this whole appointment process that usually occurs whenever there's a time of conflict. So, considering that the waves are the greatest conflict of them all, you'd be right to assume that most of the seven star heroes have already been appointed one of which unfortunately doesn't include a scythe. Of the ones that do exist here though, there's the basic ones of staff, hammer, axe, claws, and gauntlets, then the more complex ones of whip and projectile weapons. The reason for the latter's very nondescript name is that the weapon itself can transform into any sort of throwable weapon. Regardless of whether it's a kunai, throwing knife, or hatchet, the legendary projectile weapon can become all of them, making it a ranged armament very similar to Itsuki's. As for the whip, well, although this may seem somewhat weak compared to all the others, it too can transform into different weapons like a chain or flail. Not only that, but it's also said to be able to control the power of monsters. So, despite these weapons not being one of the four holy relics, their broad variety definitely made Naofumi a little bit jealous. They certainly seemed to have quite a bit more flexibility than his shield did. Now, considering the usefulness of such legendary weapons, you're probably wondering where their holders are now. Well, you'd be surprised to know that only the Queen has met them. Just like how Naofumi and the others were holding off the waves in Melromark, so too were the Seven Star heroes trying to do everywhere else. They were spread across the globe doing everything they could to mitigate the damage. That said, because none of their weapons matched the descriptions of larks or glasses, the only conclusion everyone could come to was that they were in possession of their own. So, if their world did in fact have legendary weapons similar to their own, then the next question to ask would be how many. Lark did speak as if they were quite the common thing, but there was no way to truly tell if he was bluffing or not. In the off chance that he wasn't though, that would mean the enemy could have entire armies filled with soldiers as strong as Glass was. It was a thought that made the Queen realize just how dire the situation really could be, leading her to suggest the heroes undergo some form of formal battle training. Of course, the idea didn't seem to bode well with the expected three, but even they seemed to understand just how outmatched they were. That's not to say that they agreed right there that they would do it, but they also didn't outright refuse her either. They just kinda grunted and moaned at the thought of doing something so mundane and boring. In any case, that was pretty much the gist of the meeting. A surprising fact about the world was suddenly revealed, and the idea of some formal battle training was finally introduced. There was a bit more to be said about the seven heroes after, but that's something I'm sure we'll find out eventually. Now, before we go on to the next step involving Rishia, it's important to note that her scenes from episode 25 haven't technically happened yet. She hasn't yet made the attempt to drown herself, and as a result hasn't yet been invited to Naofumi's party. Instead, what I'm about to talk about are the events leading up to that. So, it was right after this meeting with the Queen that Naofumi would bump into Rishia while she was mid-errand, clearly overloaded by whatever tasks Itsuki had been giving her. The reason she specifically was treated so poorly though was mainly due to the hierarchy system of Itsuki's party. You see, because she was the member who ranked at the very bottom, it was fairly common for everyone else to treat her like a slave. So, when Naofumi saw just how exhausted she looked, it was only natural that he offered to help, giving the two the opportunity to get to know each other better. There wasn't much for Naofumi to say about himself, but for Rishia this was where we'd learn about her backstory. Now, Fumi was rather adamant on finding out why she had decided to join up with Itsuki. This may be shown a little bit later, but in the off chance that it doesn't, I'll just briefly summarize. Rishia had come from a noble family who'd driven themselves to ruin. They didn't have very much money, and whatever money they did get always went towards the defenses provided by the corrupt nobles of the neighboring village. When the time eventually came where her village couldn't afford to pay those defense fees, that's when it was decided that Rishia would be offered up instead. She was taken by force and sent to the barbaric nobleman as payment, a fate worse than death if not for the heroic intervention of Itsuki. As soon as he had found out that this was what was happening, he immediately led his party and saved Rishia from her captors, resulting in her eventual recruitment into his party. This wasn't because Itsuki wanted her to, but instead because Rishia felt like she needed to. To her, Itsuki was this person that she owed everything to, he was her knight in shining armor that had come to rescue her. That being the case, it was only natural Rishia would want to do whatever she could to give a little bit back to him. 
she was determined to become useful to him no matter what it took. The main problem with that, though, was that Itsuki refused to use Rishia in a position where she could excel at. Despite her being quite skilled with magic, he instead decided to try and use her as a warrior. His search for frontline fighters forced her to place her stats into a melee build instead of a mage one, leading to her current struggles as the weakest member of the party. Now, fast forward a little bit to the day after, and once again Naofumi would come across Rishia, this time seemingly distraught while having a conversation with the spear hero. Unlike how you're probably thinking, though, it wasn't Motiasu who had caused her to be upset here. No, he was actually just trying to cheer her up a bit, the reasons for which both refused to elaborate on. It was only after confronting Motiasu privately after that Naofumi would finally find out what had really happened, a turn of events that would lead to one of the most badass Naofumi scenes yet. So, as we found out in episode 25, Rishi had been kicked from Itsuki's party due to a crime she didn't commit. She had supposedly broken one of Itsuki's favorite accessories then tried to hide it. When Itsuki found out and went to confront her, it didn't matter how much she tried to deny it because the other party members all said that they saw her do it. Even as she begged and cried, they still continued to tell Itsuki that she was nothing more than a liar. So, given the similar nature of this situation to his own, it was only natural for Naofumi to burst into Itsuki's room and demand some answers. Not because he wanted to prove Rishia's innocence, but instead because he had found out that Itsuki already knew about it. What I mean is that Itsuki had already been informed of Rishia's innocence. It wasn't long after the whole incident had occurred that one of the Queen's shadows would privately meet with him to tell him what really happened. They had given an unbiased report from a witness who had seen everything, an objective recount of the truth that should have been used to clear Rishia's name. But even after this statement was given, Itsuki still refused to revert his decision. He would continue to believe his party over the words of the Shadow, leaving now Fumi with no other choice but to confront Itsuki directly now. So, moments after barging into his room, a single question was all it took for now Fumi to deduce Itsuki's true intentions. He had come to realize that all this was nothing more than a plot derived from jealousy. As for where that jealousy had come from, well, that brings us back to when the heroes were meeting with the Queen. You see, Itsuki couldn't stand the fact that Rishio was receiving praise instead of him. He couldn't bear having the weakest member of his party be the one to gain all the glory. So, rather than do literally anything that would help to improve himself, Itsuki instead chose to deal with the problem by simply getting rid of it. He had ordered his party members to destroy the bracelet, then used them to testify against Rishia so that he could justify getting rid of her. It was the only way Itsuki felt that he could overcome his jealousy. As soon as Naofumi provided the proof that Rishio was innocent, though, that's when Itsuki began to frame the story a different way. He began to say how they'd set everything up in order to help her, that the whole incident was just a means of keeping her away from the battlefield. Of course, that was just a story they'd made up right there on the spot, but it was the only one they could say without having to tell the truth. So, it was right there that Itsuki would refuse Rishio for good. He would tell her in no uncertain terms that she was simply far too weak for them. Now, the moment Naofumi saw just how little Itsuki cared for the thoughts and feelings of others was the moment he realized he wasn't even worth being angry over. Before, he was just about ready to bring out the Shield of Wrath and fight everyone. But now, after seeing the true nature of Itsuki as a person, Naofumi's boiling rage was slowly turning to indifference. He was becoming fed up to the point where he just didn't care anymore. Regardless of whether he was supposed to cooperate with him or not, there wasn't a single fuck for Naofumi to give anymore which is honestly the best way I can describe just how disappointed he was. So, rather than waste any more energy getting angry, Naofumi simply spoke to Itsuki as if he was a child. He made sure to let him know exactly how much his opinion of him had fallen, which for a self-righteous person like Itsuki, wasn't something he was willing to let go unpunished. Not only was he raising his voice to the level of a screaming rage now, but he had also started to reach for his bow as if to attack. In action, now Fumi actually encouraged since he knew it wouldn't do anything anyway. So, right after now Fumi had called him a coward, it was only a moment later that Itsuki would unleash a barrage of arrows straight towards him. A series of attacks that did absolutely nothing to stop or even slow now Fumi from approaching him. Even after trying one of his defense piercing skills, now Fumi still didn't raise his shield since his attacks weren't even worth defending against. Instead, he braced himself and caught the skill right out of the air squeezing it by the neck until the magic constituting its life had dissipated. Then, once Naofumi had backed Itsuki into a corner, the only thing he could do was mock whatever measly strength Itsuki considered to be his own. 
he had made sure to let Itsuki know just how weak he really was. As someone who had just ridiculed Rishia for being too weak herself, it was quite satisfying to see that same treatment being served back immediately after, making for what's honestly one of my favorite moments in Shield Hero as a whole. It's a shame we didn't get to see all this in the anime, but that was the context behind why Rishia had tried to drown herself here leading us to her eventual addition into Naofumi's party. Now, since all this technically happened way back in Season 1, you're probably wondering where that brings us to now. Well, it wasn't long after Rishia had joined the party that Naofumi would bring up the suggestion of her becoming a slave. The reason the idea had even come up in the first place was because both Kiel and Rishia seemed dedicated to becoming the strongest that they could. And yeah, Kiel was there with Rishia as well. Unlike how we saw in the anime, he had actually managed to join Naofumi's party too. So, if both him and Rishia were truly serious about getting stronger, then Naofumi knew the easiest way to do it was for both of them to become his slaves. Reason being that there were two key skills which made his slaves far more powerful. The first was maturation adjustment which made any bit of growth significantly more efficient, then the second was ability adjustment which helped them master their abilities incredibly faster. If the two were willing to become his slaves, then both those skills would allow them to level up far faster than they normally would. A decision both were initially very hesitant to make, but ultimately accepted after some reassuring words from Raftalia. Now, an interesting thing to note about how these slave crests work is that a checklist of restrictions needs to be applied for the seal to become active. It was basically a list of actions the slave would or wouldn't be able to do. Of course, Naofumi had tried to uncheck them all, but at least one was needed in order for the spell to work. So, the single restriction Naofumi decided to place on them was the inability to lie whenever talking to him, a simple measure that basically ensured they'd never be able to betray him. Where that brings us to now is an entire arc of training that the anime decided to completely ignore. Five whole chapters of content involving Eclair and her attempt to make the hero stronger. I can't say for certain whether this is something they'll come back to or not, but it seems like Season 2 had started right after their training had finished. So, if this does look like something that won't be covered later, then perhaps I'll come back to it in a couple weeks just to explain what the Hangin Muso style is. That's pretty much the core technique the heroes were trying to learn in the first place. Once the other heroes had realized just how hard the training actually was though, they decided to try and skip on it by leaving the country. A turn of events that marks the beginning of the Spirit Turtle arc. It's hard to say what's going to be cut and what isn't right now. So, I think it's best to call it here and wait for episode 2. Now, if you enjoyed what you've been seeing so far, then be sure to subscribe since there'll be plenty more to see next week. And feel free to leave a like and comment since it really does help the video to do better. Now, before I go, I'd like to thank Lord of Heroes once again for sponsoring this video. If you've been looking for a strategic anime-styled RPG, then I highly recommend using the link in the description to try this one out. It's free and it actually goes a long way in supporting the channel. But anyway... As always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!